Hello, everyone. We have a great webinar here to discuss the acoustic imaging to detect compressed gas leaks. Uh, my name is George Rivera. I'm an engineer and sales manager for T Equipment. Uh, joining me are Michael Stewart and Adam St. Clair with Fluke Corporation. Uh, thank you both uh, for taking the time. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, just a little background information on, on these gentlemen and, and a little bit about our company before we uh, start the presentation while we wait for uh, last minute joiners. Uh, Michael is a senior manager of technology and product development. He's a level three thermographer with significant experience. Uh, he served as the program manager and application specialist for the new acoustic industrial imager we'll be discussing today. Adam is the industrial imaging category manager. He's been with Fluke for the past eight years in several roles from the factory to the field. And he's currently part of the team that's launching this new and exciting technology. And uh, let me give you a little bit of background on our company. Our company is over 16 years old and we've become a very large stocking distributor. We do really take to heart the slogan, buy from people, not just the internet, and have a qualified staff here to help you. Uh, as you can see from this slide, as a national and international distributor, we cover the needs of a variety of customer types on the left side, and the right side gives you some of the product and instrument types that we carry, in total more than a half a million products. Our company has in he invested heavily in making the website a uh, great resource. On the left side here, you can see the filtering capability by specification to narrow your search faster. On the right side is a screenshot of an internal portal that we use for better customer service. We're constantly enhancing our website and internal systems to provide a better experience for our customers. And I think we kind of hit the uh, group that we're gonna have to log uh, logged in for this uh, webinar. So let me uh, turn over presentation to you, Adam and, and Michael. Give me a second here to uh, navigate the uh, system. All right, great. Thanks, George. There we go. I believe you're a presenter now. And I'll mute my line. And if anyone has any questions during the presentation, use the chat window. Please ask. feel free to ask uh, questions. Yeah, thanks for that. And uh, questions are definitely encouraged. Uh, Michael and I are here really to, to just help all of you on the line understand this new technology. In April, we launched a tool that's a little bit different than tools we've launched in the past because it's it's not it's not something that's really ever ever been done before. So um, we're we're excited to spend a little bit of time this afternoon talking with you all about not only the tool and and how it functions and how it compares to some of the traditional methods used to, to solve similar problems, but also to spend a considerable amount of time talking about some of the applications, spaces that we've been successful supporting since we've launched. So um, we're, we're excited to spend this time. Again, questions are encouraged, and um, hopefully this will, that you all leave here today with a better understanding for, for how to do jobs that, that you're currently doing better and easier, or maybe how you can incorporate some new technology to help you do things that you haven't done in the past. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Uh, quick reminder, Michael was one of the brains behind developing this technology, and he spent a considerable amount of time out in the field using this, this technology to help customers solve problems and, and to find compressed gas leaks. So uh, Michael, why don't, uh, why don't you take it from here and, and let us know where we're Thank you hey, very Adam. much. Adam, I appreciate the uh, introduction. Hey, um, Michael, let me interrupt you for a second. Uh, yeah. Just a housekeeping thing. Uh, for some reason, the little uh, go to webinar uh, controls, can you uh, hit that? Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Thank you. How's that look, George? Yeah, how many engineers does it take to do a sure. webinar presentation? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. You're good now. Thanks, guys. 
Okay, well, I appreciate the uh, introduction. Uh, I, I don't know if I've been referred to as a brain before, uh, so I don't know quite how to take that, but uh, really, uh, I'm a field engineer and I'm an applications guy. You know, as was mentioned, I, I'm used to being in the field primarily with thermography and other kind of imaging. And this was something that was really interesting to Fluke because we're always out there in the field doing work side by side with the customers, with all of you guys, trying to figure out what's working and what's not working. And it's just not, I mean, we really have to get into, into the in deep with the problems to understand how we can create better tools to solve them easier, faster, cheaper, all of that. That's what we're really all about here at Fluke is uh, providing, uh, you know, everyday solutions that everybody can take care of. One of the things that we had uh, noticed early on is, you know, there's a lot of folks out there that have problems with leaking compressed air, leaking gases, uh, vacuum problems, any number of things. And there was just a common theme that we were seeing. Everybody cares about this for one reason or another, whether it's you know, affects product quality, if you're in a process or your food and beverage, if it affects your, your bottom line as far as your operating costs, you know, that was part of it. Uh, general performance, uh, hand tools. I mean, we were finding everything under the sun for this. And the solutions that were out there were not necessarily easy to use. You know, a lot of people are familiar with traditional ultrasonic detection tools, either a little handheld that you have to be right up next to a leak to actually see that it's there. And sometimes it has to be really quiet, you know, on a non-production day for you to be able to do that, you know, to look for what you guys call snake hunting, listening for the hiss. All right. A lot of people still doing this old school too, listening with their ears when they can or using uh, little spray bottles full of soapy water and looking for the bubbles. That stuff's time consuming. It's, it's difficult to record and, and to, you know, basically list this is what it was and tell the boss man that, hey, I found all these leaks and here's where they were. I wrote down the list, but you have no, no other way to actually prove that there was a leak there. Uh, the traditional ultrasonic stuff too, you know, it can be quite expensive and it requires a fair amount of training and experience to be able to use it and use it effectively. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but all in all, we went out there and found that this whole area had been underserved with a really good solution and people were either going real old school, they were investing way too much up front, or they were doing nothing. And whether it was from a, a production standpoint or an operation standpoint, it was costing all of us money. And I say us because Fluke was in the same boat. We actually manufacture all this stuff and we used a lot of compressed air and a lot of compressed gas, all right, to, to do what we do in our different factories. And it was costing us money. So if it was costing us money and we tend to be, you know, really lean and mean on things, we knew that it would be something to talk to us or other customers about. So we started down the technology development path to come up with a better tool to do this work, something that everybody could use. And you didn't have to be a level three leak specialist and have 10,000 hours of field training to figure it out. And I think we've done it with this II-900. So let's talk about the presentation a little bit now. See if we can afford it. Okay, so acoustic sound imaging, what is it? How does it work? It's, it's very similar to ultrasonics, except that what we have is we have a, an array, a number of different microphones that can basically hear sound and ultrasound from about 2000 Hertz, which you'll find common in human voices, all the way up to 52,000 Hertz. So it's not only just things we can hear, it's also ultrasonic, it's both. And it allows the user to go in and to adjust what frequency band you wanna look for and ignore everything else. Ignore all the machine noise, ignore your boss chattering in your ear while you're trying to get the job done. 
you know, and just focus on the things you're interested in. And it really then creates a sound image and mathematically calculates back to the point of where that sound came from within the field of view, within the scene. It's superimposed over a live video image so you can see real time what you used to only be able to hear or sometimes you couldn't hear because it was an ultrasound and then be able to capture that image in a video or a screenshot and know exactly where to go to, uh, to go back and see that again. And that's what's truly new about this. Previous technologies didn't visualize the sound. You just had a number or you had a, a crackle or a hiss that was in your ear that wasn't quite real to begin with and uh, wasn't always discernible. This is something you can actually see. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, an acoustic picture is worth 10,000 words. And I used to say the same thing about thermography and I still believe it for thermography too. So you're gonna see a lot of parallels in this. And if you're already using thermal imaging, this is a no brainer for you. You're gonna pick this up even faster. So here's one of the things. So you're gonna say, okay, great. We are actually using ultrasonic tools and we have a level three leak specialist that's doing this and we have a really expensive uh, device that you know you go around and you do your snake hunt with. Well, guess what? The way that existing ultrasonic tools work is it's not the most efficient scanning device. You have to go back and forth and back and forth and up and down and then you have to be looking at a little screen to watch the numbers go up and down or watch a bar graph go up and down in order to look for that peak. Once you find a peak, then you actually sort of take a look and try to zero in. And it takes a lot of time to do that. And even trained ultrasonic specialists take time to do this because of the limitations of the equipment. The nice part about what we can do is we can actually scan a large area and see multiple leaks at once and then go in on it. And you don't necessarily need to be highly trained on it. I have trained numerous maintenance professionals, even some supervisors to do this. You give them five minutes worth of training, just talking about how to operate and what to look for. And bam, they are finding leaks really, really fast and leaks that they wouldn't normally find. They are actually stunned most of the time when we take this onto a factory floor and we say, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. And before you know it, they're adding up and they're going, wow, we didn't realize we had that problem. Wow, we didn't realize it was going to be so easy and fast and great about documenting it too. And that's really important about documenting it. You know, and that's something that's been missing in the past or very, very difficult to do. So we think we've come up with a really good holistic solution to this that has never been available before and can be used by anybody. We even had some marketing people that were out in the field with me here at Fluke, people that don't normally get their hands too dirty you give them the same five minutes worth of training and they're out there like a pro. And I'll tell you what, a couple of them were doing just a, an awesome job at it. They were like, fine, I'm gonna sit back and drink my coffee now. We'll let the marketing people do work for a change. All right, it's got limitations. All right, no technology is absolutely perfect. This technology picks up sound and ultrasound. It's not smart. It doesn't yet tell you if it's just a reflection of a sound or the diffraction of a sound, which means the sound's coming around a corner, or it doesn't get rid of all of the background noise. Noise is a complex thing. Air leaks, gas leaks, vacuum leaks, they are not a single frequency. It's a very complex sound signature, and you just have to sort of plug play a little depending on the environment you're in to find the right bandwidth to use to be finding air leaks or gas leaks or vacuum leaks in your facility. It doesn't take a whole lot of time and after a while when you're doing this you really don't change it a whole lot unless you come across a really unique situation and, and you know there's something there and you're looking for it but 
if you're just scanning, you find something that works for your facility and you pretty much leave it there all the time. You set the unit to remember your preset setting and away you go. That makes the training even faster. But these things, understanding how, how sound and ultrasound react and interact in a complex environment with a lot of sharp angles and curves and hard surfaces and soft surfaces, understanding some of that kind of stuff really goes a long way. And you can actually use some of these things to your advantage to actually find the true source of the leak. So this was an interesting situation. I was actually here for this and uh, uh, I actually was pointing down at the floor. I was just doing my normal scanning. I'm like, oh, wow, hey, great. I found a leak on that, that air tool hose. But then when I walked around, I learned to walk around and look at it from different angles. And you really have to do that in order to make sure that that's the air leak. And you they tell you to do the same thing in thermography so you can avoid reflections. If it moves, it's probably a reflection. If it stays right there, it's probably real. And it doesn't take much to figure that out. It takes two steps to the left, two steps to the right, or you know, a little bit higher, a little bit lower, and voila, you found it. Now, in, in uh, photo A, it looks like that air leak, from my point of view, was right there on that hose. No brainer, right? I moved a little bit to the right. The air leak moved too. I moved a little bit more than the right. It moved onto the floor. Now, my brain tells me that that concrete slab is not leaking something. So I said, all right, well, if it's not coming from the hose, where is it coming from? And I looked down on that, you know, straight down on that leak from that angle. And I said, let me take that same angle back up in the opposite direction, because that would put the leak somewhere underneath the test bench. So I squatted down and sure enough, the leak was up underneath the table on a fitting up there that you would have never heard on your own unless you were looking up under there. A lot of people don't think in three dimensions like that too, but this made it easy. I was able to use that reflection to my advantage and find the true source of that air leak right away. I've done the same thing on ceilings. I've done the same thing on walls, and it's a great little trick. So this is the live view of it. This is what it looks like when you're doing the inspection. Pretty cool. I mean, that it, it's so you have to use a little bit of common sense. It's just going to pick up all the sounds. It's not going to tell you whether that floor should be leaking or not. You're going to get a lot of echoes. You're going to get a lot of reflections. You're going to get a lot of other noise from the background from your leaks. All right. But if you notice this one, what that is, is that's actually some sensor noise from the outer sensors that are picking things up. But they almost point the, point the way to the real leak. That, those, that, they're called lobe reflections. It points the way to where the actual leak is. So you have to walk around and look at things and use your common sense and saying, guess what? It can't be leaking out of that piece of equipment because there's nothing in it to leak. It's got to be this one over here. So you can even shorten your time period further on using these echoes and reflections by just opening your eyes and looking around and saying, what here could potentially be leaking? This was a really cool one because when I first looked at this one, I, uh, I, I, was, I was probably back 10 or 15 feet, and this was in the middle of production, uh, main production in the middle of a day of a facility that makes uh, wheel balancers and tire changers and things like that. So it's, it's decent, uh, heavy manufacturing, and they use a lot of compressed air. I thought there was something leaking inside of the cabinet, and that I was hearing that leak come out through that little uh, space in between the cabinet door and the frame. As I got a little bit closer, I said, wow, that's not coming from there. And I know it's not coming from the sheet metal of the frame. I wonder if that sound is leaking from over the top. So we got a ladder, we looked up on the ladder and sure enough, there were air fittings up on the top that were leaking. So you don't always have to have direct line of sight to see some of the bigger stuff. 
but be very, very careful in making sure that you've looked at it enough that you're 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 convinced that that air leak's not moving on you, and it's not a reflection or it's not diffusion of the sound over and around the surface because you're going to get that stuff. And I'll tell you what, with some of your bigger air leaks, you will see that stuff from a long way away. You may see it 50, 100 feet away. It might be way up on a ceiling and you're inspecting one part of your facility and you see something well over in the distance. Keep doing what you're doing. Go through on a methodical search of the area you're in and just take mental note of where you saw something and try to follow it. Do, do that snake hunt. You know, let this unit listen for the hiss for you. Because I can tell you, you know, I wish I had audio files uh, when this production was going on. There's no way, you know, when you were near this that you could actually hear this. No way at all. And even during uh, off production, it would have been really challenging because of where it was. The I-900 found it right away, though. Okay, as I said, th this new product is very, very versatile. Unlike traditional ultrasonic tools that only have a very, very fine uh, frequency band that they operate in, like a lot of them will say, we only operate in 48 kilohertz. We only operate in 34 kilohertz. That means that's the only time that they're listening and they ignore everything else. You might be missing a lot of things too. As I said, air leaks, gas leaks, and vacuum leaks can be complex signals and they don't always have the strongest signal at one pure frequency. So we've given all of our users the ability to choose a wide band or a narrow band from uh, uh, you know 10, 10 to 15 to 30 kilohertz down to, as far as a span down to five kilohertz. And you can just easily shift it up and down the range based on what you see in the, uh, uh, I guess, the frequency versus decibel level chart that's on every single screen. You look for peaks, you look for humps, you look for things that are a little bit different. If you have a whole area like down in the sonic range, 20 kilohertz and below where we hear, and there's a whole lot of really loud machine noise, which has been very common in some of the plants I've inspected it so far, don't put your filter right there. Put it a little bit higher up, all right? Get outside of the noise and ignore all the machine noise and listen for that noise of the leaks. So it's very, very simple to filter it. And it's also very simple to set up different preset settings on the I-900. So if you have different kinds of things you're looking for, different kinds of leaks, different parts of the factory. It's there and it's it's a button press away so you don't have to remember it. This is my uh, favorite part of doing all this stuff is finding how many different locations you can find leaks. I found leaks in a whole bunch of places, but you, know, you guys are gonna know your operations better than me, better than anybody at Fluke. You look at wherever you're using compressed air, compressed gas, or vacuum systems, and then you start inspecting those from top to bottom, from the compressor room to the headers, to storage tanks, every single potential fitting, all of the lines, uh, quick disconnect chucks. I mean, you inspect everything. If there's a leak there, this unit's going to find it for you. And oftentimes, it's going to find it at a lot bigger distance than you'd expect. If you're seeing something from 30 feet away, across a whole bunch of other noise and a whole bunch of other production equipment, my guess is that's probably a pretty significant leak. You can go over and feel it. You can spray bubbles. Do whatever you need to confirm, but it's there. This machine doesn't lie. Air compressors. All right, air compressors themselves are great, but you know you got a lot of fittings that come off of that stuff and a lot of connections, and sometimes it can leak pretty damn close to the source, and you're not even close to getting it to where you need to use the air. So make sure you're checking all these different kind of fittings, whether they're the, the quick uh, push connect fittings, you can have bad barbs on those, you can have split hoses, all of that kind of stuff will create leaks on you. 
air regulators, especially when they get older, they're going to start leaking. Those O-rings on that stuff, that is not supposed to be a consumable item, but they do wear out. Vibration, age, heat. I've found leaks on uh, the backs where you put the, the, the gauges on because somebody didn't tape them. I've found leaks on O-rings. I found just plain old defective regulators, new out of the box. So take a look at the stuff. But also make sure that, you know, if, you know, you need to distinguish, you need to know your equipment. And if you got something on the equipment that's got a purge valve or an exhaust, that's supposed to be leaking something out. And you're going to see the hiss there. Ignore it. But a regulator is not supposed to be leaking air. Discharge valves. Now, the discharge valves themselves on the exhaust point, point, they're supposed to leak out. But the valves themselves are not supposed to be leaking. The fittings and the connections are not supposed to be leaking. So check your stuff, make sure it's taped up, especially on threaded connections. And by the way, it's not just threaded connections. I've found leak, leaks on brazed connections as well. Take a look at this really fast and look at, look at all that noise that's down there below 20 kilohertz. That's the stuff we hear. That's compressor noise. All right. That's machine noise. That chart gives you frequency versus decibel level. So down there, you're talking 70, 80 decibels of auditory noise in that particular area where you would want to be wearing earplugs and you can't hear a hiss if you listen to it, you know, even right up close to it. There's too much. But you can find a range that works for this that finds that leak. You know, I'm not going to tell you how much compressed air food and beverage processing use, but uh, every time I've been in one, um, bottling plants, packing plants, we've always found stuff. And you wouldn't think, you know, one little leak, they're like, oh, big deal. It's not costing me that much money. But when all of your equipment is run on compressed air, if you've got 150 leaks in that facility on any one day, that's significant compressor cycling, compressor usage, which means you're paying for it in extra kilowatt hours. You're paying money for that every year, and it adds up. Boilers, boiler efficiency. You need to make sure that your air fuel mixture is right. If you've got leaks on your air lines, you're going to have some problems with boiler efficiency that boiler is going to cycle on and off when it doesn't necessarily need to. So you need to be looking for stuff like that. So you can use it on, on those kind of systems as well, not just compressed air. Okay, this is really going off. It's not always air that's compressed. Sometimes it's natural gas. When you find an issue like this where you've got leaking around a valve stem, that's not just, hey, I'm losing money on the natural gas I'm paying for. That's also a significant safety issue. I was in a plant um, last, early last summer uh, testing this technology out, doing field work with it, and I saw something uh, way up in the rafters of the ceiling that I thought at, least, at first was a compressed air leak and a pretty hefty one. We saw it from the floor level, we couldn't even see. It was so dark up there. We had to get up on the mezzanine. We go up on the mezzanine. We shine a flashlight way up there. We take a look at it, and the technician said, that's not an airline. That's a natural gas line, and who knows how that's been leaking up in the ceiling. We need to shut things down and like take care of things right now, and this was a major manufacturer. So just imagine what would have happened if they would have let that go forever and ever, and you happen to have a spark up there enough, it's not diffuse enough, and, you know, that whole building goes up. Imagine the cost of something like that, not only to the equipment, but to the lives of the people that are in there. So this can be used for things like that, too. And I found leaks on nitrogen tanks, leaks on oxygen tanks in hospitals. I found leaks on uh, 
uh, carbon dioxide uh, argon mixed tanks that are used for welding gases. You name it, it's out there. And I'll tell you what, some of that stuff serious money. Argon's an expensive gas. If you're leaking that stuff off into the atmosphere after you just felt paid for a truckload of it, that's costing you money. There's also safety concerns with a lot of these gases. Think about all those all those nasty uh, uh, gases that are used in uh, chemical processing. All right, think about ammonia gas leaks. Think about other things. Now, this will not tell you what gas is leaking out. This will just tell you that there's a leak of some sort. You have to use your brains to understand what lime that is. Sometimes it's not about the actual production equipment. Sometimes it's about the product. I've been in a couple of different plants that make semi trucks. You know, the big Kenworth and Mac and stuff that's out there, some European manufacturers. And you go in there and they, they run a lot of the, the braking systems and other things off of pneumatics or compressed air. All right. And if those systems are leaking, something's going to be working right on that truck. And they're going to get the truck in for service again. Once again, take a look at all the noise that was right here. All of the noise from that operating engine. And we're still able to find a range that finds something unusual. Nitrogen leak outside. That's just costing them money. That's all it is. See those dollars go floating by. Dollars going floating by here, and this is also probably affecting some kind of process, probably a refrigeration process or something else at an industrial plant. This is expensive. I'll tell you, I actually went to a manufacturer of compressed gases that takes the gases out of the air at sea level, you know, temperature and pressure, and they refrigerate it. And they compress it and refrigerate it and compress it and refrigerate it and compress it in a big outdoor operation. And then they separate the gases off into different tanks. And if they've paid the money, all of that electrical power, and trust me, I looked at their power bill and it was huge every month. We're talking the largest single user of power for that particular power company in the region. And if they're paying all that money for compressor, compressors and refrigeration, and then they're leaking their final product off into the atmosphere, there's going to be some heads rolling. That's money right there. All right, duct leaks. Now, this can be used for HVAC in certain circumstances, but it has to be under pressure. You have to have some direct line of sight. This particular thing was a duct that was a ventilation duct to get rid of all of the, the coal dust that's being filtered out. Now, if you're filtering this stuff out and you got leaks, okay, your, your compressors are using a little bit more than they should. Your head pressure is probably a little bit too high to pull all that stuff out. You also have a potential safety concern if you got enough of these things and it's not pulling enough of the dust out. I've seen similar kind of vacuum systems used for laser cutting uh, material that has to pull those exhaust gases and pull the small particulate matter out. And if you've got leaks in that kind of duct and vacuum system, your equipment's not going to have the kind of lifetime that you want to have. And you've also potentially having some kind of health risks for the employees that are in that immediate area. So you have to go in there and understand that there's a bunch of different reasons, a bunch of different things that could generate value from this technology for you in your plant. Uh, so think about it. Think about movements of air or gas or vacuum. Hell, we've even seen a vacuum system in a bakery that moves flour from one point to another and delivers the flour to where it needs to be needed for the mixers. And if that thing gets clogged up or backed up because of vacuum leaks, guess what? They don't have their optimal production or their Twinkies aren't tasting really tasty because they didn't use the right ingredients or any number of other things. So think about that. It's not always the obvious places that have compressed air or compressed gas or vacuum. Think about it. You guys know the operations better than we do. Give it a try. Get a demo. Um, 
you know, if you got questions here, ask us the questions too, because we've got a lot of answers. We have done a lot of testing and we'll tell you what we know. All right, well, that uh, concludes the, the application part of it. Um, George, I think I'll turn it back to you. I think you have a, a screen you're gonna pull up and if there's any questions from, from the folks that have joined us, um, this would be the time that we're gonna field those. And, and if there's any that you haven't typed in, uh, please do. George will read them aloud so everybody can hear what the question is and then uh, Michael and I will do what we can to get those answered. All right. So a second. couple of things too that I hear people ask on a regular basis as well. Are we there on the T equipment side? Yeah, uh, we're here. Um, so this, uh, let's go through this real quick again. That's just my last slide. It has our phone and email. Uh, there is a uh, slide deck that we, uh, if you type on our website, IWH course, or if you go to that link at the bottom of this screen, um, you'll uh, be able to pull pull uh, not only the recorded webinar, the slide deck uh, of this particular one, but also others that we've uh, recorded uh, uh, before. Um, you know, so it's definitely a good place to, uh, to take a look at um, uh, for additional uh, information. And um, there's one question, uh, and I wanted to give you guys, uh, have you seen this test on four millimeter tubing on production machinery? That's um, all I got, yeah. I, I don't know about four millimeter in particular, but it, it really depends on the flow rate out of the leak. So if it's higher pressure, higher vacuum, it's a no brainer. Uh, we've actually tested this uh, down to about, uh, it'll fairly reliably find um, uh, leaks uh, flow rate of about uh, five to 10 uh, cc per minute. So that's five to 10 cubic centimeters per minute, which is a small, a small leak rate for some people. And it's a gross air leak for others. So what I'll tell you is it really depends on what the process is that you've got going on. And if you're looking for leaks that are like very, very tiny refrigerant leaks or a very, very tiny uh, leak off of a vacuum system, that's going to be a little bit of a problem for you, especially when you got other machine noise going on there. We're trying to get the equipment to get the technology to get more and more sensitive, even though we haven't even had this existing one out in the market for a year. We're already working on how to make the next best thing. Um, if you're looking for something that you typically have to use a helium sniffer for to find leaks in a parts per million, parts per billion situation, this isn't the product for you. That's just way too fine and ultra, ultra fine for you. So I don't know if that helps answer the question, engage it a little bit, but it really, it depends. You're gonna know your stuff a little bit better. Okay, uh, here's another question. Um, some ultrasonic devices calculate the approximate uh, CFM related to the leak. Uh, is that something that uh, is available now in the instrument or? or I hear that again and again and again. It's not available right now on, on uh, the Fluke product. And here's part of the reason why. Um, even though some competitors out there in the ultrasonic space have products that create these calculations, at very best, it's a rough guesstimate. The way that the physics of acoustics works, you have no repeatable way to say this air leak will create this sound signature or this decibel level with this pressure. It just doesn't work like that. Every leak is a little bit different. You look, even if you look at things at the same distance and the same angle of view, you try to control the variables, it's still difficult. I can create 
10 different leaks in my lab here in Everett that all have exactly the same flow rate, but very different characteristics with regards to frequency, you know, peak frequency and peak decibel level. So when you've got a situation like that, you just have to guess a lot of the times. So I hate to tell you guys this, even you, you know, level three NDT or, or PDM leak specialists, ultrasonics guys, those calculations are a little bit of BS. You know, I wouldn't rely on them too much. They're good enough to prove to your boss that you're worth, you're worth something. But the only way to truly understand a leak flow rate is you put a leak flow cup over the whole thing and you physically measure mass flow rate. And these products cannot do it. I don't care if you're using ultrasonics, sonics, whatever else. It is not an exact thing. With that being said, I know Fluke has been asked about this numerous times. We will do our best to come up with some kind of educated guesstimate as well and provide that to people as time goes on. But we want to do a little bit better job than uh, the pr traditional folks have done on this. And we want to also educate people and show them firsthand uh, why we're right on this. This is just simple science. You know, Bill Nye will back us up. Any of you guys know Bill Nye, the science guy, he'll back us up on this stuff, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Um, it, the On the images that you were showing, there's a spot size there. What, the, the larger the size, does that mean you have more level of leakage or what, what does it tell you? Um, not always. Um, what that spot size represents is the decibel level at the center expanding out from the sound. And it just, it's just a way to show you, sort of pinpoint what the, si the sound is. Uh, it typically does not get bigger as the sound gets bigger. But what you can do uh, is you can control your level and span, so to speak, and to bring in a, an old thermography turn on and, uh, term in, and you can control the size of that spot to help you, I guess, manually control the instrument and pinpoint that leak even further than an automatic mode. But that's just basically the way that we've chosen to indicate it right now. And the higher decibel, because the way that sound works is when it's generated at a particular point, it travels out in a sphere and eventually gets into a big wave, like waves at the beach. And that's actually how all our sensors see this stuff. But as it travels out from the center of that distance, from where it actually occurred, that sound level, that decibel level decreases. You know, if you've got a Harley Davidson or some other, you know, motorcycle right next to you, it's a lot louder to your ears than it is if it's a quarter of a mile away. Even though it's the same sound, that sound dissipates over distance. So that's what that color is really showing you is that it's, it, it's giving you sort of a pinpoint of where that is. So that darker color in the center that or lighter color, depending on the palette you choose, that's always where the center, uh, center of the, the sound's coming from. Uh, Michael, what if you want to have it fixed in an in a stationary location and walk away? Can can it uh, do something like that? Connect to the internet, alarm you, or uh... um, we we get asked that question too. Um, this unit is meant to be 40, fully portable at this point. I would not recommend leaving it somewhere for a while because it's going to get legs and somebody else is going to think it's cool and they're going to walk off with it. Um, it doesn't also at the present time have a Wi-Fi connection to be able to connect to the internet. Uh, we've talked about semi-fixed and fixed applications. Stay tuned from Fluke, working on that stuff. One of these days we're gonna get it out. We wanna make sure we get it right. You know, this was our first product to market with this technology. It's a new to world technology really to be used for these kinds of purposes. So. We've got a little bit of time to work the bugs and the kinks out, but we, we hear you. We're listening. We've heard a lot of people that say they'd like to have it too, and it, it's on the roadmap of things for us to think about. Okay. Well, while we're on the related subject, uh, well, what's the battery life of the of the unit? So if you're walking around uh, with it all day, or how, how long of a life do you have? You, you guys, that's a great question. Um, we have much battery, much better battery life than we planned originally, and we have pretty strict standards too. Uh, 
but you're going to easily get a full day's worth of work out of this thing. Each battery, uh, you know, if you left the unit on constantly, you're probably going to get about four to six hours, uh, if not more, depending on your usage pattern. So each I-900 also comes with two rechargeable batteries. So you can swap it out and get a full day's work, even if you're working a 12, 14 hour shift, which I hope you're not on the factory floor looking for snakes and kisses all that long. But if you are more power to you, this product's going to keep up with you. Okay. And uh, what about the question from, from myself? Uh, you had different uh, pictures there, different distances. Is there an optimum distance or what's the minimum and the maximum range for for orienting the uh, detector? It really depends on the leak, you know, and this goes back to how sound propagates. Sound, you know, the farther away from the sound it is, the smaller the decibel of the level, the more difficult it is to detect, unless it's louder at the source. You can hear a hundred decibel car horn farther away than you can hear uh, uh, a 20 decibel cat meow. All right, so just think of it, think about it in those kind of terms. So the really small or minute le leaks, you need to be a little bit closer. The really big leaks, I've seen some pretty substantial leaks from 150 feet away, believe it or not. And it was shocked me at how I could still see them. And I immediately knew if I were seeing it from that far away, that was a big leak. All right, because and it was a pretty loud leak up close too. Uh, likewise, you know, you know, some of these things that I've seen at uh, 10 cc per minute. They're pretty small leaks, and they're leaks that you might find around uh, a brass hose fitting that isn't properly taped or tightened up, and you can barely feel them. And even when you spray, spray snoopy water, uh, you know, uh, soapy water on them, you know, they're going to bubble a little bit, but not too much. Those kinds of things, uh, I've been able to see a meter away and still see them fine. You know, it also depends on your environment. Is it really, really windy out that day? There's a lot of chatter. Is there a lot of machine noise? What kind of leak it is? So it's going to vary, but, you know, really, functional distances within 20 feet, you're going to be a whole lot of see things. If you see something you think is a leak at 20 feet, you're not quite sure, get a little bit closer, it'll pop up for you. But you don't have to be, you don't have to be within a finger's distance. Gotcha. Uh, Adam and I were had been talking offline. I had a customer that was interested in uh, in the unit, and they were looking at uh, natural gas leaks. You had that slide there, but I, I think in yeah. that slide that it was under a higher pressure. Uh, normal like uh, residential and commercial is is pretty low. It, it's inches of water column. So I, I was curious uh, if you can elaborate on on those applications. Um. You know, I, I haven't done a whole lot of natural gas inspections. The other thing you have to keep in mind, a lot of natural gas lines are buried. So this isn't going to see stuff underground through the dirt unless it's a really, really big one. You've got better ways of detecting the leaks with sniffers and stuff like that. But if it's an exposed setting, you know, under pressure, uh, I've seen everything from 4 PSI to 20, 25 PSI regularly. And depending on the size of the leak, I've actually found them. Uh, I know it, it doesn't really matter what the gas is per se. It matters about the flow rate that's coming out. I've actually found, um, uh, I've, I, I've found leaks out of a, a 0 0.035 inch diameter hole in tubing that was under half a PSI pressure, and I've been able to see it from 10 feet away. So it depends on the nature of the leak. I, when we were first demonstrating the technology, I had a little setup here in our engineering offices during one of our, our big employee meetings, and I actually showed us from 50 feet away, I showed that same kind of leak under four PSI pressure. With everybody talking and chattering and our president up there talking and directors and everybody else, everybody was stunned. So it depends on your conditions. But okay. I give it a try. The other thing I really watch out for on natural gas lines that I've noticed is you also get certain kind of flow noise and flow cavitation. So do not, con uh, do not confuse 
flow cavitation with a leak. This is why it's important to walk around and look at it and to still physically inspect. But when you do see a leak, it's pretty obvious. It's a, it's a big round circle most of the time and it does not move down the pipe. Okay, well in the case of natural gas, you could always follow it up with a sniffer uh, of some sort, you know. Uh, it's, a, it's a good practice, a very good practice to do that. Uh, uh, last question, because it looks like uh, there's a rat of questions, but uh, still got a few minutes left if, if anyone has a question. Uh, can you talk about using it for uh, other applications like corona discharge? You know, right now I can't. Um, it's something that we're we're thinking about. We've been doing a lot of research on. We've found some customers that are interested, but this product uh, was designed and optimized primarily for compressed air, compressed gas, and uh, um, vacuum leaks. Uh, we know that people have used ultrasonics in the past for uh, corona, uh, but uh, we're we're not to the point where we're ready to say, yeah, this is specialized for that, but it's also something that we're looking into very seriously. Okay, that's definitely uh, I would not. I would not immediately recommend, recommend this product. Uh, can you just, uh, I guess the last thing I had was just a little bit more about the specifications, uh, like how many images you could store, uh, PC software, or, you know, what... what uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, you, you can restore, uh, you can store about a thousand different images. Uh, video clips, I think, uh, right now have capability up to about 30 seconds a piece. They're M MPEG-4 uh, videos. Uh, you can, uh, uh, I think the data sheet says that you can do JPEGs or PSD files for the still images. Um, we don't have specific software for this right now. You are not able to save the raw images yet, just a still image or a video. Uh, you can take those still images and video and email them, whatever else. Uh, you know, you uh, store them on the unit and then uh, plug it into a USB cable and you can dump all the images onto your PC. I do recommend that. It does have onboard memory, but, you know, that can be volatile memory and you never want to leave that stuff on there too long. You know, it's hard to sort through everything and you want to get the stuff from the day's work off uh, anyway. It's just a matter of best practice if your maintenance uh maintenance professional. Um, other things, uh, see what we've got, it, it's not, it's not waterproof and no, it will not work underwater. And yes, I have gotten that question. Same way that I've gotten the question on our thermal <laughs> imagers underwater. Okay. So, you know, try to, try to be cognizant of that. We do our best to ingress protection. Um, uh, we do our best to make this rugged and reliable. I do recommend using the neck strap because it can get a little heavy uh, when you're using it all day long. And that's also an extra safety procedure for you. So keep that on there for the durability. Um, you don't want to clean off the, the array head where the sensors are with uh, heavy compressed air. Don't want to do that. That's not good for them. Uh, you typically want to use a, you know, if it looks like there's dust or debris that's in there, you want to use like a little photo brush or something like that, or, a, you know, a clean artist paintbrush to clean that out, or, you know, a, uh, a, a photo bulb that they use to clean camera lenses with. You don't want to be cleaning it with dirty rags up on the sensor head. The rest of the unit is a pretty typical fluke unit. So. Okay. Uh, Looks like we're out of questions. I'm sure you may uh, have more questions as time goes on. There's my email, phone number. Feel free to call me or one of the other engineers at our company. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, help you. Uh, we uh, certainly uh, can work with you. Uh, we have uh, demo units that we can send out to you uh, domestically here. And uh, anything else, uh, be happy to work with you. Uh, guys. Michael, Adam, appreciate your time. Thank you. It was very informative and, um, you know, looking forward to uh, seeing more, more of these features as they, as they come out. We're working on it. Thank you very much for the invite to talk to your folks today. All right. Thanks, thanks George. Bye-bye. <laughs>